scientist with over 23 years of clinical experience in India and the UK. Her subspecialist interests include metabolic risks in South Asians, diabetes prevention and rem remission, high-risk pregnancy, preconception care, and technology in diabetes. She's the clinical lead and MDT member of antenatal and diabetes technology service in a large tertiary center in the UK. She's also the faculty for master's in diabetes course, University of Warwick, and the MDT member of neuroendocrine service in a European NEPS center of excellence. Her clinical expertise is in thyroid, pituitary, and bone disorders. Members of various international societies such as DUK, ADA, EA, EASD, etc., and a fellow of the RCP UK. She's also a consultant medical advisor at Practo, responsible for the diabetes remission program Transform. We also have at us Vilasni Baskaran. She has come with over 22 plus years of experience as a specialist diabetes, weight management, and bariatrics dietitian, and has worked in multiple capacities in the UK and India. She was previously associated with WHO as a program officer for diabetes research, prevention and awareness, and with UNICEF as a maternal and child health nutrition consultant. Currently, alongside Tracto India and NHS UK, she's also a lead primary care specialist dietitian UK, a clinical team manager for diabetes and weight management digital program in the UK and a guest lecturer for Coventry University UK. With this, I will hand it over to Dr. Hema to begin the webinar. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me well, Keshul? Yes, Dr. Hema, we can hear you. So welcome, everyone. Thank you, Keshul, for the kind invitation and uh, for the introduction. So today's um, talk, I'm coming back to this talk after a year. And uh, so I did the same talk about a year or more ago. but. Um, Things have slightly changed. We have more data. We have more long-term data. So I'll include all of that, and I'll talk to you uh, all about diabetes remission and how the, and the changing scene of diabetes care in India. Uh, Dr. Hema, can I? Yeah. Dr. Hema, yeah. Yes. So we have seen. We can see some participants raise their hands. Uh, is there something you want to guys to tell, Devati and Mr. Gu Dr. Guru, Dr. Devati? So, um, okay. So they just raised their hands. So if you have any questions, probably we'll have after Dr. Hema's presentation, we'll have a pause and then you can all reserve the questions there. Is that all right? Thanks. Yeah. So um, these are my disclosures. I am a medical advisor for Practo Chronic Care and I'm the lead for the diabetes remission program led by Practo. So these are my disclosures. I do work for Practo. But this meeting is an educational meeting, not a promotional meeting. And um, the, the whole agenda the reason for my presentation is to educate doctors across the country about the changing scene of diabetes care. So these are my roles. I work at the University Hospitals Birmingham, which is a very large trust, tertiary st trust that manages over, employs over 250,000 people, uh, 25,000 people. So it's a very large trust. And uh, my interest, as Keshul said, is diabetes remission, Asian metabolic risk, and technology in diabetes, amongst the other endocrine roles that I have. Um, today's agenda is mainly a couple of things for me. So I'll divide this talk into three parts. The first part is my talk where I talk about the science behind diabetes remission, the evidence behind diabetes remission, what are the studies that talk about diabetes remission, and then how we as doctors, uh, yourselves, myself, di endocrinologists, diabetologists, we can play our part in the diabetes remission journey of our patients. So that's my agenda. And then I'll pass over to Vilasani, who will talk a little bit on the dietary aspects and then uh, we will end about end um, our talk about uh, with um, uh, uh, with uh, with some questions from your side. <clears throat> so the early concepts of diabetes remission. So I will talk about some very early studies, very very pop well known, very robust, very uh, well done study called the Diabetes Prevention Program, done in 1995. So very you know, old study. We were all very young at the time. So. This study looked at, followed up people for about five, five years. It followed up people with pre-diabetes. It followed up people with a risk of diabetes for over five years and uh, randomized them into th three groups. So 
people with pre-diabetes, one group was given lifestyle change, which was quite closely monitored, given exercise, diet, etc. The second group was just given placebo. The third group was given standard medical care, which means the standard medical care that's given in clinics by most of us. In a very busy clinic, in a day-to-day -day clinic, very few of us have time to sit and discuss lifestyle in a very detailed manner because time is a big constraint. And even if we did that, we don't have control over what our patient does when they leave the consultation room until they see us again. So these three randomized trials, the red was placebo, that is standard medical care. The yellow was metformin and the blue was lifestyle change. And they followed up these patients for five years. And we found that people who were given lifestyle change lost up to seven kgs in the first year. And if you followed them up for about five years, you found that their um, the incidence of type 2 diabetes reduced by over half, 50%. There was a 50% reduction in type 2 diabetes in these patients who were given good lifestyle changes in the beginning, in the first one year of their pre-diabetes. So this was, again, a link to say that um, weight and diabetes had a very close link. And lifestyle changes could cause a big dent in the journey of these patients. So this was one of the earliest studies in the diabetes prevention program. There were various other diabetes prevention programs across the country, across the world. This was the American one, but we have the Darkin study and the Finnish study. They all showed about 50% reduction in diabetes risk with good lifestyle given early in the diagnosis of diabetes. I have somebody saying my slides are not visible, Lakeshal. It's visible to us. Uh... I think it is um, their, um, I think it's their settings. You'll have to. You can pin uh, Dr. Hema if that helps. You can pin me Dr. in the slide presentation, actually, not me. Yeah. Yeah. You can pin the slide presentation so that it appears in the beginning. It appears as the main screen. So this is the first slide. The second was a very interesting study. They did nothing. They just followed up these nurses between 1986 to 1994. They followed up women, hundreds of women. They followed up over a period of uh, nearly eight years. And they looked at the development of diabetes. So women came in all shapes and sizes. You have the lean people and you have the obese ones. And you can very clearly see that the risk of diabetes, so on your y-axis was the number of, was the proportion of diabetes per thousand women. So if you had a BMI of over 35, then maybe 9% was the risk of diabetes. And this slowly reduced with BMI. So again, weight gain and obesity was recognized as a driver of diabetes very early on it was not rocket science we all knew this so and then came evidence from our surgeons so we had uh, various studies telling us that bariatric surgery could get rid of diabetes and the rates of remission following bariatric surgery was astounding so if you look at some surgeries this is uh, gastric this is gastric bypass and this is banding and bypass. This is only gastric bypass. And this is gastric bypass with BPD. So you found that the rates of diabetes remission at two years was nearly 70%. Of course, dropping off with time. By 10 years, it became 36%. But the rates of diabetes remission one year or two years after any uh, bariatric surgery, weight loss surgery, was, was very high, well over 70%. Imagine getting rid of 70% of your patient's diabetes with bariatric surgery. Of course, diabetes, uh, bariatric surgery comes with its own um, negatives, comes with that it's major surgery, it's life altering, it has complications, it has a lot of other problems. But the theme remained that if there was something we could do to tackle weight, then diabetes went into remission. So that theme was emerging well before we actually did a study on it. The Another point to note is the diabetes remission in bariatric surgery does not wait for one year or two years. It happens within one week. So soon after bariatric surgery, even before the actual weight loss happens, patients go into remission, patients stop their insulin. So there was another theory emerging that yes, weight is important for uh, weight loss is important for diabetes remission, but there is something else that actually is playing a part for diabetes remission before the actual weight loss process happens. So this is another very interesting study done uh, in Scotland. It's a very small study. And they did not, it wasn't really a study, it was a retrospective analysis of case notes. So they looked at people who were diagnosed with diabetes and followed them up for a good few years and looked at their weight trajectory. 
they found that people who actually lost a good amount of weight in the early years of um, diabetes diagnosis. So the x-axis is the weight loss in kgs in the first 12 months. So in the UK, in the early days, now nobody has the time, but in the early days when diabetes was diagnosed, everybody would be seen by a dietitian in detail. They would have, a dietitian would be sitting in the clinic along with the doctor. They would spend more time with the dietitian than the doctor. So that was the practice many years ago. This was a 1990 study. So they found that when diabetes, um, when there was good amount of weight loss in early years, life expectancy improved. So these people lived longer. So about seven years of life was gained or lost. Seven years of life was lost if that initial weight loss was not achieved. And if you know the current, I mean, all of us know the kind of treatments that are available for us. Now we have GLP-1 analogs, we have SGLT2 inhibitors. But prior to that, we did not have any treatment that actually controlled the disease process. Yes, we controlled the sugars, but we did nothing for weight. We did nothing for liver fat we did nothing for pancreatic fat so this was the um, and this study actually showed that the number of years that you could gain by uh, by by targeting weight loss in early years of diabetes was not small it was seven years and it's quite big for patients who are slightly elderly with other problems so this again proved that uh, weight loss normalizes life expectancy in diabetes not only does it put diabetes into remission there is a gain in years also so then came the actual discovery of diabetes remission. So until then, nobody was talking about remission, but they kind of knew that weight was related to diabetes. So if you tackled weight, diabetes got better. But diabetes remission as a concept did not come until the, as a concept was not recognized until 2017. So it all started with a small study of 11 people in 2011. So it was the same group that actually came up with the diabetes remission protocol. So it was a small group in Scotland and in, um, in Newcastle, that is northeast of England. They joined together, looked at only 11 people, put them all on a very low calorie diet, a meal shake replacement of only 600 calories a day, and watched them for about eight weeks. That's it. So eight weeks, these people were on a um, low calorie diet. So what they found was within week one, all the fasting plasma glucoses became normal. More, everybody went into remission, as in normal sugars, normal diabetes uh, values. And then the hepatic glucose production went back to normal. And the hepatic fat production went back to normal. So this was ast astounding. Within one week, we found that the sugars were normalizing in when they were put on a very low calorie diet. So this study was called counterpoint study. And I think it is something that will this study maybe change the scene of diabetes care thereafter. So it is something that we all need to remember for the rest of our lives. And I think we are fortunate to be practicing diabetes in this era where diabetes remission has come as a huge life game changer. So what they also found was, look at this. This is in a week. In a week, they found that this 36% liver fat was reduced to 2% liver fat. How many people do you see in your clinics with fatty liver, lean people with fatty liver? They all have fatty liver, high you know, enzymes, high SGPT, high SGOT. ALT, very raised liver enzymes, but they are lean and they have diabetes, but they have fatty liver. And that is a problem which all of you must have seen in clinical practice day in and day out. And there's a recent publication that 50% of people with diabetes in India have in Asia, let's say Asians, 50% of Asians with diabetes have fatty liver. And it's a big problem. And look at this, this is astounding. The moment they lost that weight, or no, they were not even losing weight at the time, but the moment they, they had that calorie deficit, they lost a significant amount of liver fat that went to 2%. So this generated a hypothesis called the twin cycle hypothesis, where they said, actually, you can reboot your pancreas. Until this, I think until this, diabetes was still, we were all taught as students, as young doctors, we are all taught that diabetes is a progressive disease. And, but th this twin cycle hypothesis actually challenged that theme, challenged that belief. So what they hypothesized was actually your type 2 diabetes was happening because of excessive fat in the liver and therefore excessive fat in the pancreas, which was then causing beta cell dysfunction. Excessive fat in the pancreas, what it did was it caused, the, you, we all know as medical students, as do, young doctors, we've all been taught that fat has an inflammatory, uh, inflammatory um, effect. So fat and adipokines, they cause a lot of inflammation in the, in the pancreas and therefore reduce beta cell function. But there was also a theory that if you manage to lose that fat in the liver, then there is less fat in the pancreas and beta cell rejuvenates. So this was the 
twin cycle hypothesis. It was a hypothesis until 2017. So then came this. This is something I want you to all go home with to remember that the direct study was uh, something that changed the face of diabetes. I quote this study to a lot of my young obese type 2 patients. When they come to me saying, is remission possible? Is there evidence for this? This is the study I quote. There is a website called direct.co.uk. You can go and look up the website. There are presentations on the website. There are a lot of um, informations. There are publications on the website. There's a lot of information on that website. So this study is a game changer for the world about how diabetes could put, be put into remission. And even the word remission came from this, this trial. So diabetes remission was a primary care led. That is GP led, completely led by GPs. No endocrinologists involved. No special equipment was there. It was done predominantly by GPs. It was led by the GPs, but implemented by non-doctors, implemented by dietitians. So just giving you an idea of how um, simply diabetes remission can be achieved with the guidance of doctors like you. So this was a uh, it was a randomized trial. So basically several centers took part in it. Um, average age was, I will go back to that. So, um, so this was the inclusion. So we had people between 20 and 45 years, 65 years of age. BMI starting point was 27, going up to 45. Diabetes di year, the duration of diabetes was under six years. Remember that they did not take anybody with longer duration of diabetes beyond six years. HbA1c, of course, diabetes duration. Exclusion, they excluded anybody on insulin. They excluded anybody with other problems. They excluded pregnancy. They excluded complex other medical conditions. So these were young men and women who are obese, who had diabetes of less than six years. So that was the inclusion. And what they did was all these people were put on a total diet replacement. Basically, they were put on shakes, milkshakes. Um, this diet is called the soup and shake diet. They were completely stopped. They completely stopped solid food. They were put on milkshakes and soups, which is not very uh, sustainable, as you would all be thinking now. But it was a good proof of concept, proof of principle. So for three months, they were given just these milkshakes and soups, liquids, liquid diet that reduced their calorie intake to about 830. So they were on a very low calorie diet. The calorie intake was about 800 something for three months. Subsequently, they were slowly reduced. They were given uh, food reintroduction was done. They were given uh, food to solid food to eat, but on a healthy uh, eat, eat well plate. It's called an eat well plate where you have carbohydrates, you have protein and you have fiber. So they didn't go back to their previous methods of eating, but they went to a healthier eating plate. For two months, slowly that food was reintroduced and these shakes were taken away. And these patients have were followed for two years. Now we have five-year data also. So it's a five-year-old program. It's quite old now. So in 2017, we had uh, data. You know, it started in 2017. We have five-year data now, 2023. So I, I hope I'm clear until here. So it's a short duration of diabetes, obese people with diabetes. And this was a dietary intervention. It was called a soup and shake diet. So this was, this was the outcome. So this red line here was the target. So basically, until then, diabetes remission was an unknown concept. And these guys who were doing the study had to go and get funding from Diabetes UK. So they had to set a target. So they set a conservative target of 22%. They said, I will get remission in 22% of my patients with this diet because there was no precedent. There were no other studies before this. And public health of England said to them, if you achieve 22% diabetes remission with this diet, then I will have to change the policy of England, England healthcare policy completely. We'll have to change the way we treat diabetes. So 22% was thought to be a game changer because that the government said that at 22%, we'll have to change the way diabetes care is given across the country. But what they achieved was outstanding. It was surprising even for the researchers. So what they achieved there was that in 12 months, the amount, the degree of remission that they achieved was 46%, nearly 50%, nearly half of them went into remission, which means they went off all medications achieved a HbA1c of less than 6.5 at 12 months. At two years, it was still pretty good, pretty still 36%. So about a third remained in remission. The others had relapsed back into diabetes. So up to two years, this data was still good. It was still above the target. So it it kind of shook up the public health fraternity in the UK saying, you will have to change the way you deliver diabetes care and not put these patients on medications without 
potential without strong lifestyle advice. I think medications have their unique role and have their role in diabetes. And some patients, I think more than, let us say, 30, 40% of our patients do need medications. I am certainly not saying medications have to stop. But an attempt at good lifestyle change must be the cornerstone or the first um, method of treatment of diabetes in a newly diagnosed diabetic. So if you look at uh, remission by 12 months by weight loss, we found that patients who lost up to 10 kg, about a third of them went into remission. Patients who lost 10 to 15 kg, about 50% went into remission. Those lost more than 15 kg, 86% went into remission. So this 15 kg, remember that um, the average weight of these patients was 100 kgs. So it's a 15% weight loss. So those who lost 15% of their body weight, especially those who are overweight and obese, they, they have a great chance of going into remission. Nearly 80% of them went into remission. What were the other benefits at two years? Not only did they go into remission, their blood pressure lowered, and few, they were on fewer medications. Again, until this study, this weight loss was not such a prominent strategy for blood pressure control. Um, we all knew that, yes, obese people had diabetes. If they lost weight, it had hy hypertension. If they lost weight, their blood pressure will go down. But this was not proven so beautifully until the study. And lower cardiovascular risk. They did something called a Q-risk. And that Q-risk, I think some of you might be familiar. It's available on the internet. You can look at Q-risk as a cardiovascular risk. It tells you the 10-year risk for major cardiovascular events. So after this diabetes remission, when their weight changed, when their blood pressure changed, when their diabetes changed, they found that the cure risk was halved by remission. So you could tell your patients that your risk of stroke or your risk of major cardiovascular events are reduced by 50% if you attempted remission and attempted weight loss, which is a huge gain. And of course, lower medical costs. So there is one um, surgery GP practice in um, Scotland that keeps publishing results about diabetes remission. So this is a single practitioner. He, I think, uh, caters to about few thousands of patients. So I'm just giving you an example. A few of you got together and started this remission as a, as a tool, um, as, a, as a first treatment tool. This doctor actually has published. His name is David Unwin. You could look him up. So he published about how he lowered medical care costs significantly by using attempting diabetes remission. So the way it works in the UK is the central government gives all these GPs a certain pocket of pot of money to manage their patients. And it's up to you, it's up to the GP how they spend that money. So this particular doctor actually um, used diabetes remission as his first protocol and managed to make big savings. And he published to say that the medical care costs were significantly improved com uh, compared to standard medical practice and better quality of life. Definitely better quality of life, which was also um, depicted in the direct study with using various questionnaires. And you in your clinical practice, you could use questionnaires. There are a lot of standard questionnaires that we are using in Practo also um, that you could you could document quality of life. And there are various ways you yourself could document saying, you know, what was the starting point of the HbA1c? Where are we now? Starting weight, where are we now? Cure score, where are we now? What was the quality of life there? Where are we now? What was the so there are various ways of documenting your own successes following in your own practice following diabetes remission. So Again, 2019, some more fascinating data that I always tell my patients, especially the younger ones who are overweight with bad lifestyle. Okay, So they also measured liver fat and VLDL and pancreatic fat. And they found, if you look at the second bar, uh, this is non-responders. The first one are responders. The first one are people who lost weight and went into remission. The second one are people who did not achieve remission or did not lose weight. Liver fat fell significantly. Liver VLDL, which is a carrier of triglyceride, fell significantly. Pancreatic fat fell significantly. So you can see all these changes happen. So people who come in with fatty liver, we give them a saroglitazar, we give them pioglitazone. And uh, we often don't have the time. I mean, we all are to blame. I am to blame too. We don't have the time to sit and have a proper lifestyle conversation. Even if we had the time, we don't have the resources to follow them up. And if we actually did a good job at that, then this is what we would achieve, a good 30, 40, 50% reduction in liver fat and pancreatic fat. And look at this. This was actually a pancreatic morphology study using MRI. This was how the pancreas looked at, looked like when they had diabetes. It was shrunken, small, ragged. It lost its appearance. 
and a lot of patients come to me saying doctors have told me my pancreas has failed i can't do anything so yes it is partly true based on the duration of diabetes but now the current evidence is challenging that now so this is how the pancreas look like if you look at the first little picture and this is how it last started looking like at 24 months so the pancreas increased in size the pancreas raggedness increased re reduced it became smoother and more expanded because all the fat reduced so pancreatic volume increased the raggedness reduced and the maximum increase insulin secretion also improved so this was very fascinating data 2020 not very old and it's worth talking to your patients about this as maybe this will motivate them to make those very difficult lifestyle changes lifestyle changes are not easy to make we all know we are all guilty of the same but uh, this is something i use and tell my patients again with a caveat that not everybody is suitable for emission you all know that but we have a good chunk of those young um, newly diagnosed diabetes clearly lifestyle is the problem they have fatty liver they're overweight for them this is a life savior what were the dropout rates i think i know all of you are thinking about yes it's okay but you know how long can you have a rigid diet dropout rates were not small 25 percent dropped out in one year 14 percent dropped out in year two um so what we need is what we have here is a proof of concept that remission can be achieved with good lifestyle with calorie deficit but maybe we should use better methods that are more adaptable for our culture in india and for the indian community i don't think our indian patients may or may not be suitable for uh, soup and shake diets and not even not just indian nobody else in the i mean it's not a very physiological thing to do to be having soups and shakes for three months so i will just tell you briefly about the five year data so this is a five year data 2023 april so we have some five year data uh, from follow up from these patients there's an extension period for another three years 85 patients from the intervention arm and 82 from the control continued. Only 11 of the intervention group remained in, inter in remission at the end of five years. So only 13% remained in remission. So what happened is at the end of two years, that close follow-up was lost. They were given the advice, but this close controlled follow-up was lost. So at the end of five years, the proportion dropped from 46% at one year to 36 at two years to only 13% at five years. Again, I would say this reflects on the difficulty in sustainability, not so much um, the concept of diabetes remission. Do we have any data in Asians? Do we have any data in lean people? So all of you will agree saying, yes, this is OK in BMI 40, BMI 35. All my patients are BMI 25, 26, you know, lean, no muscle, little bit of tummy, and that's it. What do we do for them? How do you ask them to lose weight? And so to answer this, there was another study called the Retune study that is still not published. So they looked at people with a BMI less than 27. So which is the less than the overweight category in white people, but still 27 is uh, obese in Asians. So they said that there is a personal fat threshold. So everybody with diabetes have a personal fat threshold beyond which they get diabetes. For some people with healthy liver, healthy pancreas, this threshold is 28 or 29 BMI. For some people, this threshold is 26. For some people, it's 23. So I see a lot of patients in our program who come in with diabetes with a BMI of 23, 22. And that is their personal fat threshold beyond which they are pushed into diabetes. And if you see these lean, so-called lean people with diabetes, they still have fat in the liver at BMI 23 where or 22, where they should have no fat. They are storing fat in the ectopic sites, in the liver, pancreas, in the viscera. So basically, there's a problem with fat storage and they have diabetes. So their personal fat threshold is very low at 22. So what do we do? Do we still ask them to lose weight? So th this study tried to answer that question. So at 12 months, so they were given exactly the same as what I so said to you in direct. They were given soups and shakes for three months and then food reintroduction. So their BMI reduced from an average of 24.8. See, a BMI of 24.8. Uh, you would say is oh, pretty normal, right? Although we know that for Asians, 23 is the cutoff for overweight. Seldom do we sit in clinic and see somebody with a BMI of 24 and say, you're overweight, you need to lose weight because majority of them look lean. They look well and the patients don't take it well when I say you need, you need to lose weight. So that conversation is a very difficult one to have in a clinic. When I see somebody with a BMI of 24 and diabetes, I know that they are storing fat in ectopic sources. They are storing fat in the liver. They're storing fat in the pancreas and they need to lose weight. 
and they need to get down to 23 and below but that having that conversation is a very difficult one in clinic especially with the family and uh, most of them do not look at weight loss favorably because they lose muscle and hardly these people don't have much muscle so my practice in india is very very uh, tricky and challenging compared to my practice in the uk my practice in the uk was easy i saw overweight people bad lifestyle easy lose weight here we have lean people who eat fairly healthy according to them and with bad diabetes so it is a challenge and it has to be done with a lot of sensitivity and has to be done very carefully and you have to set the right expectations for the patients also so these patients lost bmi reduced to 22.4 which is bang in the normal range from an average of 24.8 which is overweight for indians 70 percent achieved remission in the first cycle so compared to 46 percent here 70 percent achieved remission and they found that 8% body weight loss was needed for diabetes remission for these people compared to 15% body weight loss for them. Liver and pancreatic fat mass fat levels reduced to normal completely. So the outcome in these lean people was very good. Actually, the positive out the outcome in this in the retune study was much more promising than even direct. So we were a little worried about what how these lean people would re, would react to this weight loss, but they did really well. So 8% body weight loss is what was achieved in these patients liver and pancreatic fat was reduced to normal and nearly 70 percent went into remission so very promising data for our lean indians uh, who have diabetes so again you can look at direct versus retune comparison um, remission of diabetes following weight loss in 60 percent here in 67 percent with weight loss um, and if you look at liver fat before and after weight loss huge reduction in liver fat in direct study even in retune study, there is a big reduction in liver fat. But if you look at this, people had diabetes with much less liver fat in the lean category. So this is pancreatic fat and this is liver fat. Again, similar to direct study, but different magnitudes. So before I finish, I was been talking about the direct study alone, but to let you know that there are other trials also. So there are very uh, other trials that, uh, that proved that remission was possible that came after direct UK. So the direct at uh, the diadem study that was in the Middle East in Qatar uh, did very similar um, uh, interventions like the direct study. They showed that about 61% could achieve diabetes remission. What I would say to this is, you know, that difference between your current diet and the new diet that you're going to put on, that gap or the difference in calories, that is going to determine your remission. Uh, my, my gut feeling is in Qatar, in the Middle East, it's a very poor it's a carb rich very high dense calorie diet and therefore the difference that you're going to achieve in a good with this direct study is huge so with that big difference they lost a lot of weight so i always ask my patients where they are now and where they're going to be so if their current meal is if their current lifestyle is very poor very carb rich no exercise they are very good positive factors i say you know you are very far off the line if you actually so therefore your chances of remission are very high if you changed whereas if i have someone who is actually eating fairly decently who exercises every day and who is lean and who has diabetes his chances of remission are much less because the gap is much less and then we have some uh, usa studies verta health and look ahead trial these did not actually focus on diabetes remission as a outcome so their um, you know um, outcomes were much lower but again, this proves that with weight loss, remission is possible. And it's a message that you have to give all your overweight patients, especially newly diagnosed patients who are under six years of diabetes uh, duration. So I start my consultation with a remission talk with these young people. Um, I do prescribe medicines, which we all do. When we see HbA1c of 9, 10, etc., you can't be sitting there not prescribing medications and giving them a diet. Um, you know, you have to give them a diet and lifestyle counseling, but you have no control over what happens to them when you leave, when they leave your consultation room. So unless you have that control and you have that constant follow up, um, you, you are forced to give them medications. But um, in the setting of the practical program that we have, we have this very close follow up that my junior doctors follow these patients up on a regular basis, on a daily basis. So we have that control and therefore we are we don't start jump to start medications very early. So we have a good safety network around us. And if you have that safety network, I would recommend very strongly to start lifestyle first. So in clinical practice, so now it's OK to do this in a trial circumstance. It's OK to do it in a di direct trial. But how difficult is it to implement this in clinical practice? 
So before going to that, I'll talk about diabetes remission. So what do we mean by remission? We mean HbA1c below 6.5 of all medications, sustaining this for three months after uh, diabetes, after uh, stopping medications. So that is diabetes remission. And they should have gone through a period of at least three months of lifestyle change. So totally it's six months. You need six months of intervention to say diabetes remission is possible or has happened. So if patients come to you and say, oh, diabetes remission, you know, it's not possible. Is it, is it a myth? Is it true? I believe a lot of patients come to me. And to me, the answer is this. As a government, the NHS, the UK government has ruled out, has rolled out national programs across the country. So now they started off as a pilot a few years ago, 2018, they started off as a pilot. As of this year, uh, that is all general practitioners, all GPs have to um, refer their patients to a national diabetes remission program. But therefore, if there was no evidence, a government like UK who is very tight with money, it's a government funded healthcare system. So we run a national diabetes remission program. I do not see any patients with diabetes under six years of age because they go to the GP and go to the remission program as straightforward. They only, I only see the complex ones who have who are long-standing diabetes, who have foot problems, kidney problems, or who are on insulin, etc. But this is the first port of call. So if a country like the NHS or if a healthcare system like the NHS is rolling out a national program, there is evidence behind it. And I would strongly recommend it to your patients. So the other question that keeps coming up is, is this reversal? Is this remission? Is it complete reversal? Am I getting rid of my diabetes? So this generated a lot of discussion, not only in India, but across the world. So all these five um, organ organizations, they sat together and actually came up with a consensus in 2021 to say that we have to call it remission, not reversal. Because the moment you say reversal, our patients end up thinking, end of story, I can go back to doing what I like. I have no diabetes. I'm going to go back to eating my own you know, usual diet. I will have sugary coffee or idli vada, masal dosa, gain weight. Uh, continue to you know lead a sedentary life i won't be at a risk of diabetes that is not true so remission means you know your risk is still there <laughs> but the disease process has been brought to a halt and in analogy with our cancer colleagues so what we do is so this is remission so if you go back and gain weight you will get diabetes back again so that message i give very very clearly to all my patients that this remission only will last as long as your lifestyle lasts, as long as your weight lasts. The moment you go back to your old version, you will get diabetes back again. But you have the tools to bring it back again into remission. So it's about education. A lot of, we are all not robots. We have our weaknesses. And we have our ups and downs in life. Our life journeys, our life processes happen. So life events happen. So, But giving them uh, education about remission will give them the tools to put themselves back into remission without relying on you. And as healthcare professionals, I tell my patients, it's my duty to actually educate you so that you can manage your diabetes without needing me all the time. And to make them, empower them to do this. So who would you refer to diabetes remission? This question has come up from a lot of our GP colleagues in India. And therefore, um, so who do we refer? Um, the typical patients in our program are uh, patients between this age, eight, 18 to 14. I've picked up this from the UK program. What I do in India is slightly different. Anybody with type 2 diabetes under six years of duration, because that was what was there in the trial evidence. BMI more than 27, that was the UK program. In India, it, and, and the UK program, again, recruited people more than 25. What I do is slightly different. The age remains the same. I don't have a real age bar, you know. I even take 70-year-olds with newly diagnosed diabetes, who, if they are fit and they're willing and amenable for lifestyle change. Diagnosis of diabetes less than six years, I, I tell them that their chances of remission are very high under six years, but I also take people up to 10 years because there is some data for up to 10 years. It's not impossible to achieve remission up to 10 years, but the data is not very robust. I don't promise them remission. I don't promise anybody remission. <clears throat> I say your chances of remission are very high under four years, good under six years, existing under 10 years, about 10 years, the diabetes remission data is patchy. It is non-existent, and my gut feeling is with years to come, that data will improve. Um, especially if you have the overweight, poor person with poor lifestyle, then about 10 years is also not impossible. Yeah. And my BMI cutoff is actually 23 plus. If I have somebody with a BMI of 24 or 25 with bad lifestyle, 
fatty liver, two years of diabetes, uh, diabetes duration, their chance of remission are pretty good. So I would I still take them. So basically, our program in uh, is is lifestyle program. The outcome could be remission or the outcome could be good diabetes control with minimum medications. So many patients have different endpoints in that journey, but the journey is the same. And these are the predictors of remission, as I've already told you. The duration of diabetes is definitely a predictor. Dependence on insulin is a predictor. So if you're on insulin, your chances of remission are lower. But having said that, there are a lot of caveats here. Some patients get started off insulin, started on insulin much sooner because they come in with such high values. You have no choice but to keep the patient safe. You start them on insulin. That doesn't mean that their pancreatic beta cell function is poor. So if you have had long-standing diabetes on insulin, yes, the chances of remission are low. Lower C-peptide means lower pancreatic function and therefore chances of remission are low. That I think is a good marker. And we find that O overweight people, obese people in the early stages have very good C-peptide levels because they are in the hyperinsulinemic phase. And therefore, a lot of fat in the pancreas. Pancreas is really struggling, good C-peptide levels. The moment we get rid of that fat, everything settles down. Actually, C-peptide comes back into the normal range because that stress, stress is removed. Age is a good predictor. Also, I think age is a good predictor because uh, they are less or more amenable to lifestyle changes. BMI is a predictor. Lean diabetes is difficult. It's very, very difficult. And having practiced in India now, after years in the UK, I know how difficult your job is uh, as physicians looking after diabetes. Many of your patients are lean. You can't ask them to lose further weight. They have no muscle. It's hard. So lean diabetes is hard. I still have some hope between BMI 23 to 25. Even about 22, we have achieved remission. As it goes around 21, 20, it's a difficult journey. So BMI is a good predictor. So when you have a lean patient with diabetes, I tell them you have lean diabetes. It's a difficult ball game. I can't promise you remission, but we'll follow the journey. The journey is the same. I'm going to stop here. So basically here, I've so far I've presented to you the science behind remission, how you can tackle your patients, who do you promise remission, how you can work with remission. How to achieve remission? is uh, there are various methods to achieve remission. Bariatric surgery is one I already alluded to. Um, lifestyle change, which includes diet and fitness, is the other. Medications is the third. But medications, typically, it goes against your uh, definition of remission. So we have GLP analogs that have been shown to put diabetes into remission. But we don't have data on what happens after you stop the GLP-1 analog. That data is not there. And our general feeling is once you stop the GLP analogs, they will go back into diabetes again. So I'm going to stop here. I will take some questions if we have time. Um, Keshal, do we have time? Yeah. Or should we move on to I think uh, there are some questions, Dr. Hema. Why don't we take them? We just spend yeah. maybe two minutes on the questions and then sure. We'll sure. Ask so, Dr. Om Prakash, um, welcome to this talk. So you've asked whether the study includes HOMA IR. Yes, it does. Can the patient resume normal diet once they achieve diabetes remission? So very, very good question. All our patients do ask it. So the answer to your first question is very easy. Yes, the study does include insulin resistance data. There are about, there are, I mean, few, uh, few, I think 20, 30 publications from the direct study. If you look at the direct website, all their publications are listed. So there are there are publications that talk about just the liver and um, pancreatic fat. There are other studies that talk about all the biochemical parameters, including insulin resistance, HOMA IR. And yes, the insulin resistance does reduce. Uh, because the um, pancreatic insulin sensitivity, insulin, insulin sensitivity improves, and HOMA IR or the insulin resistance does improve with weight loss in the direct study, but does improve with weight loss and loss of pancreatic fat and loss of liver fat, no doubt. The second question is a very tricky one. Okay, so can the patient resume normal diet once? So the question is, what is normal is very skewed in our minds. So I think this direct study and in the years to come. We are going to be challenging the norm, challenging what is normal. So what is normal diet? And my strong belief with now oh, having worked over in the last year or so, um, I have just done diabetes remission work in India, nothing else. OK, assume so I have uh, seen so close to 300 plus 400 patients digitally and looked at their journey on a daily basis so which you know not as a, as a clinician but actually managing them in this program seeing their daily journeys seeing their daily meal plates seeing their daily blood sugars and i am now rethinking what the norm is so yes answer to your question is yes and no number two uh, one is yes the soups and milkshakes etc they will go that is not sustainable so they will go back to their 
not eating normal food but what is normal is very different so what we currently consider normal in india and the rest of their world rest of the world in terms of the amount of carbohydrates we consume is probably going not going to be normal again it is our job to ex educate our patients that what they consider normal currently the quantity of carbs that they eat currently the portions of the carbs that we eat currently not they we all of us including me eat currently is not certainly normal and introducing there is something called an eat well plate or the uh, plate method according to the ada or vilasani will soon talk about what is called the t plate that is going to be the norm including carbohydrates in a small portion but actually including proteins and including fibers eventually our goal our our aim as healthcare professionals is to see that we eat like this and all our restaurants serve food like this and the culture as a culture we as a culture change so yes you can resume solid food after that period of shakes but do not look upon this as a diet it is not a diet it is healthy eating and we tell our patients this is be prepared to eat like this for the rest of your life we ask them we don't ask them to stop rice we don't ask them to stop roti we don't ask them to stop chapati or uh, dosa or idli they still eat it but they will not be eating four idlis with chutney alone they will be eating a bowl of salad good amount of protein and one or two idlis that is going to be their norm for the rest of their lives other answer to your question number 2 is yes if they can maintain their weight with fitness then they can eat normally so the aim is to maintain weight how you do it there are many methods i hope that answers your question mr om prakash dr om prakash okay so um, dr revathi ravi kumar has asked about a sample diet suitable for south indians yes yes we do have it uh, vilasani will be talking about it um, in the next few um, next few sessions next few slides again lean long standing diabetes is a challenge i completely agree it's a challenge we can change diet but it's going to take a generation my gut feeling is going to take a generation so it's about building muscle improving their protein and it might take a long 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 time for them to change body composition so for them to achieve this just with weight uh, just with diet is going to be very challenging so we can it's possible but it's not difficult does a 5% weight loss too yes absolutely yes any amount of weight loss 5% is a very good amount of weight loss with 5% we have seen so in the program and vilasni will tell you very soon when we change their diet to the tea plate we just follow a balanced plate we don't do any of soups or shakes or no herbal life none of those with that we find that within one week patients go off insulin we can't give them insulin they go off sulfonylureas because they have hypos i cannot manage them with sulfonylureas or insulin beyond a week if they follow the diet and this diet is a diet that we follow lifelong i don't want to call it a diet vilasni will tell you very soon why she doesn't call it a diet it's a healthy eating pattern is it possible to reduce weight you are using technology only without uh without proper lifestyle eating habits and rem and is remission possible probably not answer is no technology will aid you to pro to help um technology will aid you to help accept lifestyle changes better technology will aid you to give you information but answer to your question is no and yes so you know the freestyle libre device or the um, sensor device just there are trials where you just put them on a freestyle libre device and didn't do anything else they went away use their libre device they came back with better hpa1c's better weight and how did that happen it they just may became more aware of their sugars and they inculcated lifestyle changes themselves so it can happen without um without you necessarily giving advice but it will happen passively it will induce some lifestyle changes i don't think it's possible um there are no quick fixes unfortunately for asian people with diabetes there are no quick fixes a big lifestyle change it is like a revolution you know that happened in the french revolution you know we have to bring a big revolution in terms of our eating habits uh, dr jagdish asked a very valid question waist circumference is more meaningful than bmi in clinical practice absolutely absolutely correct um yes especially in asians um i think bmi is a very crude measure very very crude measure it doesn't account for your muscle it doesn't account for your bone weight and yes waist circumference is a great marker of visceral fat and we do use it and waist circumference is a direct correlation to cardiovascular risk also but often so if you have a very sophisticated fitness regime where you have a muscle building regime and um, where you lose fat and gain muscle then you can use uh, a waist circumference i often encourage my patients to weigh especially for the lean people when they say i am very lean where do i lose weight i ask them to do their waist circumference and hip ratio waist hip ratio and tell them you know you're storing all the fat there but 
um, the interventions from there are very similar. So yes, Dr. Jagdish, I completely agree with you. The visible fat is the problem for diabetes, um, and waist circumference is a much better marker than BMI. Absolutely agree. Anything else? Any other questions? If uh, there are no further questions, so I'll move on to Vilasani, who will talk about, answer all your dietetic questions. And I think uh, her talk will be more useful than mine because uh, I've given you things that you already know. But Vilasani will be talking about diet. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hema. Thank you. That was a really good presentation, brilliant presentation. Welcome you all. Um, I hope you can hear me clearly. I'm Bilasni Baskaran. So these are my credentials. I'm a registered advanced diet dietitian uh, presenting um, with the UK. I'm registered with the healthcare professional and I'm also associated with the British Dietetic Association here. So I joined my career i started my career as a who program officer and then further moved on to unicef and then now i work robustly with the nhs on the diabetes remission program on the counterweight programs and the low calorie diet programs and also uh, it's a big thing here we have multiple digital programs here on our nhs platform and i'm also associated with the type 1 type 2 diabetes in diabetes uk and a guest lecturer with coventry university so I was just going uh, was during the presentation what Dr. Hema was presenting, it was absolutely, she clearly set out the platform what diabetes remission is and what is it possible or not and various other evidence-based studies were all presented. Now we all know what diabetes remission is, but now achieving that remission is possible but there are three ways to achieve remission. One is the bariatric surgery. I'm also a bariatric dietitian, specialist dietitian, where we do the gastric bypass sleeve gastrectomy and of course the remission is possible. But what is not possible, what we found difficult was after we did a follow-up study after the um, biband sleeve study, and there are several studies we are still doing on, and we are finding that the people are still started to regain weight after the bypass surgery, after the sleeve gastrectomy, which is going to put their diabetes at risk again. So it is highly likely that the diabetes remission cannot be a remission anymore if they start putting on weight. That's the another one. Then the other line of interventions, we have the medications, medical conditions, other medications. For example, there are different medications that's happening, Olistat and other things, which I'll be talking later. And then beyond this, there's a third strong weapon we have, which is the diet and lifestyle changes. Because what we found out as clinical dietitians in our practice is that the first bariatric surgery and the pharmacological therapy to diabetes remission or to weight loss will not happen on its own it has to be connected it has to be linked with the diet and lifestyle so without diet and lifestyle the first two will not work so if the first two needs to work they need to follow a diet and lifestyle pattern so this is what we have found out and this is still happening and this, this, the, there's a lot of established evidence around it so when it comes to diabetes diet we have a really really big list of big compendium of diets on the google Name it keto diet, intermittent fasting, because every day today in the clinical practice, we have patients um, talking about we have followed this diet, we have followed DNA diet, we have followed Atkins diet. But what they come up to the point is I followed these diets for three months. After that, I have put on weight. I follow, I stopped the diet and I put on weight and my blood sugars, when we see their blood reports, their HbA1c would have gone up very high, which was previously under remission would have gone up high. So the question came into mind was, Yes, they are following different types of diets. We all know that. But are they sustainable? Why can't they follow that diet throughout the lifestyle? And my putting myself into, into that, that cadre, would I be able to follow such kind of strict, restricted diets long term throughout my lifestyle? My answer would be no, I can't do that. And it puts under a lot of stress. And this kind of not being able to follow different types of a prescriptive diet is not just physiological it's more physiological it's more towards psychological approach so um this is what i was about to tell why diets don't always work because normally when the patients come in even the direct trial we had seen 25 percentage dropout in year one and 14 percentage dropout in year two although it showed promising results but did it study the sustainability the limitation with the direct trial was the shoe the soup and the shake diets and also was it sustainable? Were the people were able to follow the similar kind of diet through the lifestyle? No one knew the answer. Of course, there are none of the studies knew the answer. There was a one large systematic study uh, on patients, 10 year study on bariatric patients, um, 10 year study on bariatric patients. And also there was another study uh, which proved that 
95 percentage of the people were not able to follow these diets after a 12 month period so in this particular slide this was an outcome of patients they did study they did take around 14 different diets and did a study for 12 month period and what they found out was after a certain period of time more than 90 percentage of people were not able to stick to one similar diet and this is more of a psychological response and this study was not directed uh, this study was not carried out in a physiological side of it it was more psychological and what they found out is there's a strong influence of the gut brain axis and the hypo, um, hypothalamus pituitary axis the gut brain axis nothing but a bidirectional communication which is mediated by the neurological immunological and uh, hormonal signals and there is a strong communication and this is the channel which the gut microbiota uses to impact the neurodevelopmental processes and the brain functions and this any dysregulation of this gut brain axis which is the vagal nerve communication which happened there's constantly the body sends signals the brain sends signals remember the ghrelin hormone which is secreted by the intestinal lining which is secreted when we are hungry and then the leptin hormone which is secreted by the which is a uh, appetite suppressing the satisfactory hormone which is produced by the adipose cells so these two hormones play a very vital role in when to send the signals of hunger when to send the signals of satiety and all these are controlled by the hypothalamus um hypothalamus one so this is where any dysregulation of the gut brain axis is strongly associated with the metabolic disorders and also the second one is called as a hypothalamus pituitary axis any dysregulation of this axis has been found to be strongly associated with the upper body obesity because there are the pro-inflammatory biomarkers are um or have shown or have established to stimulate these uh dysregulation of this hpa axis and these two uh, play a strong role in uh, managing uh, why diet why what what our responses are what our psychological responses are um in this particular study what they have shown is any any patient or anyone who is put on a diet they have a strong they initially start on with a strong mood set and then they slowly their mood set reduces to negative point and they reduce their intrinsic factor the intrinsic control is all reduced and when this happens over a time period the the mood sets out to become a negative mood and in order to set the negative mood right they follow into a vicious cycle of going back to the whole old habits so it's becoming a vicious cycle so which means if a patient is on a particular diet for so let's say one or two months or three months and after the three months when they wanted to when they see a weight loss and they see diabetes remission for example what they do they go back and then they wanted to relax and what do they relax how do they relax they eat a lot and whatever they were craving for they will go on and they will eat and then once they see their blood sugars coming high and their weight putting on they again get depressed they think their hard work has gone waste and then they go on eating so it's just a vicious cycle that is what means a lot in this um, psychological response so considering all these features when this program, when we when we were speaking on diabetes remission, what stood out as uh, among the American Diabetes Association, among the dietitians in the British, in the British Association, we decided that it's no longer going to be a prescriptive dietetic approach. Prescriptive dietetic approach. I also see one of some of you asking about a prescriptive diet plan. Here you go, take the diet plan, and then you follow the diet. I can give the diet plan for day one, day two, day three, day four, but I can't give a diet plan for 365 days. And if I'm going to give a restrictive diet chart to a patient, I am making sure the patient is completely relying on me for the whole of my life, whole of his life. And can the patient follow a particular set of diet throughout the lifestyle? Of course, not possible, because when they go on to their friends or families or other outside parties or any social events, my diet plan is not going to work out there because whatever options I have given is not going to work out there. It's not going to be there at all. So what can we do? I wanted to empower my patient with adhere with something that can give adherence that can ensure sustainability that is practically possible whatever is in the household whatever we can give that can be given to the patient so that it's practically possible so that they don't have to run outside to get a specific product called diabetes product to make it clear there are no special diabetic products and all those products that are claiming to be good for diabetes is not good for 
it's not good for diabetes because they don't read the nutritional label. The nutritional label, such as diabetes horlicks, they contain sugar. What we fail to see is that we, we see the front part of the label and we say it is suitable for diabetes and we buy it. But what we fail to see is that the back, the nutritional label where they have clearly mentioned beneath the carbohydrates there is a part of sugar which is nothing but an added sugar that is going to spike the blood sugars that is not going to allow patients to control the blood sugars at all so to make it clear there is no diabetic products there is no specific products required we need a balance we need a consistency we need a sustainable plan and are there other elements to eat uh, if we want to achieve this consistency if we want to achieve this um sustainability in diabetes remission what we need to do is the first step is that we need to have satisfaction now this is where most of this is the key factor the satisfaction we are never satisfied when we start on a meal with rice we are never start satisfied when we start on a meal with chapatis have you wondered why we don't get satisfied when we are starting on a meal with carbohydrates because all the carbohydrates are very very soft and the transit time we call as a um, gastric emptying time is very quick because normally a food should stay in the tummy for at least three to four hours but unfortunately the carbohydrates are very soft sloppy in nature that they slide down the food pipe and they go out of the tummy quickly releasing the sugars in the bloodstream quite quickly that is why we are not satisfied with a smaller amount of carbohydrates but if we if i increase the amount of carbohydrates to bigger amount of carbohydrates my blood sugars can spike my weight will go high the reason being, body doesn't store sugar as sugar. Most of the sugars are stored as fat. It's a bad fat. And that's why we put on weight when we eat a lot of carbohydrates and our sugars level spikes up. Now, the satiety factor is one. That is why I have listed in the top. The satiety is dependent, uh, completely dependent on the textures. The textures, there are different types of textures. Soft, smooth, sloppy, crumbly, hard, dry, firm textures. This makes me can I control. interrupt here? I will just yeah. tell the other doctors listening is uh, Vilasani brings in a very unique angle of dietetics and uh, I've learned a lot of dietetics from her uh, over the years and talking about textures and satiety and satisfaction and craving is something that's very unique uh, with uh, with her and I've learned a lot here actually especially textures and satiety so I think this will be very useful including for me thank you Vilasani. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hema. That's something which I found out. This is in a day-to-day -day clinical practice where we can all experience. Even you can go home today and you can experience the same thing. Try to bring in the textures because now the carbohydrates are very soft. I can't increase my carbohydrates, but at the same time, I wanted to achieve satisfaction. The question, there's a big question. So I need to introduce other elements of food that are rough in textures so that can hold these carbohydrates so that my tummy is full. I have filled my tummy not with the carbohydrates but with the other elements such as fiber and such as proteins because fiber and proteins have a tough textures they don't break down easily like carbohydrates when these two strong pillars hold the carbohydrates they don't allow the body to break the carbohydrates easily and the whole food is kind of a fulfilling meal that it stays in the tummy for long remember one thing the hard work the tummy is getting the longer the food stays in the tummy Chew and eat, chewing and eating, eating slowly, everything aids satisfaction. Everything, the brain takes around 20 minutes to understand whether we are eating or not. If I'm going to eat quickly, the brain will forget, will not know that I have taken my food. So when I eat slowly, the brain will really understand that the food is coming through. And this is where the hormones here. It will release the hunger satisfactory hormone, the leptin. If the brain doesn't sense that signal, it will keep on secreting the ghrelin, which is the hunger stimulating hormone, which means you will eat bigger portions to satisfy your hunger. So you will not feel satisfied in the smaller portions. This is why textures are very key here. Please, to the previous slide, please. Okay, so now we have spoken about the textures, but these textures, the satiety is governed by the composition, which is carbohydrates, proteins, and the fiber. And then the third one, is again the first two are the vis visual guidance but the third one is the mindful eating which is the psychological guidance where the hunger cues say there we eat at different times of the day we eat how many of us eat when we are only hungry I, I is there any answer how many of us eat only when we are hungry i could see in a clinical practice if it is in a live session 
I would say most of the patients will, most of the participants would not put their hands up because we all eat at different points of the day, irrespective of whether we are hungry or not, we eat. We eat when we are happy. We eat when we watch a movie. We eat when we go out with the friends. It's all peer influence. It's all a society pressure. So we eat at different points. We eat as a habitual eating, isn't it? So at that point, the issue is here. It's not the tummy that wants the food. So this is why we brought in the mindful eating. Again, this is governed on the intuitive eating principle, which is uh, characterized by no food polis, mindful eating, know your hunger signals, when you're hungry, when you're not hungry, there is a hunger scale for that. So this is why constant munching will not help. You need to have a regular periodical set pattern, meal pattern. So this is where this whole principle is governed on the intuitive eating principles. And this is why I don't like to call it as a diet. It is healthy eating governed by our brain and the tummy, both. And then order of eating also matters a lot. Um, so moving to portion control, this order of eating gives the portion control. Because if you start a meal with carbohydrates, definitely you're not going to stick to the little amount of carbs. You're going to go overboard. So that is why change the direction. Try to start your meals with vegetables. And because it's an educational webinar, you can try and educate your patients also. And you can yourself educate. Try this at home. Try this technique at home. Try to start your meal plate with vegetables and then add some proteins. And then last choose your carbohydrates. And I bet you won't be able to eat more than two chapatis or even one chapati. And you won't be able to eat your regular portion of rice. And Dr. Hema pointed out a brilliant, um, he, she highlighted a brilliant point. What is normal? Whatever we are eating now, is termed as normal, but that is not normal anymore. A plate full of rice is not normal anymore. Uh, half a plate of rice is not normal anymore. So the question is, should I avoid rice? Should I avoid chapati? Of course not. Because still 50% of the calories around has to come from the meal. Because carbohydrate has to come from the carbohydrates, sorry. Because still carbohydrates uh, cater to 50% of the calories to the body. The rest of the calories should be divided between the proteins and the fat. But this 50% should come from good carbohydrates. And this 50% can be satisfied by three or four tablespoons of rice. You don't need a plate full of rice to give this 50% of calories. All we need is a four tablespoons of rice. But if we start on the meal with the first four tablespoons of rice, you won't feel satisfied. So never do that. Try to start on with the proteins and veg and then go on with your carbs. Next slide. So this is the T-shaped model. This is what it is established by the American Diabetes Association after several years and also by the British Dietetic Association. Now in my cl uh, clinical practice, we also have the, I'm a, I was a part of the counterweight trial, but what we see, see in the counterweight program, in the low calorie diet program, the dropout rates are very, very high. Patients come in, in the first sitting when they see the direction of the program, like they have to be on the shakes and soup diet, they come for two or three weeks and after that they disappear. They drop out. That is because they are scared to follow the diet to follow and they know for sure they can't follow that or they will follow intermittently. So that is not going to be helpful. So this is why we brought in a model. We need a visual guidance. We don't need a calculator sitting at the table. We don't need a paper or a pencil sitting at the table. We don't need someone to count our calories and tell us sitting at the table. We wanted a free lifestyle. And at the same time, I, as a patient, wanted to not only manage my diabetes at home, but also wanted to manage my diabetes elsewhere, wherever I go, like kind of in a restaurant, in social events, in a friend's party, wherever I go, I need to manage my diabetes. And the answer is the visual guidance, the T-shaped plate, where the question marks, the top question mark, the half plate is always vegetables or salad or anything, any form of vegetables. But unfortunately, what we are seeing in the Indian uh, program currently in the in our Indian program is the vegetable word is kind of a boring program and they keep repeatedly asking the question is do I really have to add the vegetables every day and I'm bored of adding the vegetables in a salad form of course not you don't have to add the vegetables in a salad form it can be in any form as far as you're not overcooking it but do I have to add the vegetables in every meal you have to because we need as per the recommended dietary allowance we need 30 to 35 grams of fiber in a meal in a day and then um, in a day, sorry, not in a meal, in a day. And that can be provided only by the vegetables. And there are different, and this also not only gives a good chance of diabetes control or diabetes remission, but also it gives a good chance of reducing the cholesterol, the overall lipid profile. 
which means the fiber, the insoluble soluble fiber, they form like a gel-like substance. The soluble fiber, when it connects with the water, it forms a gel-like substance, which slows down the gastric emptying aid uh, rate, which means we feel satisfied for a longer period of time. We don't get the hunger pangs or the craving. And the second form of fiber, which is the insoluble fiber, which adds bulk to the stools and also it binds with the cholesterol and excretes the cholesterol out of the body, thereby helping to reduce the cholesterol levels. So many of our patients who have managed to improve their HbA1c or glycemic control, who have managed to achieve diabetes remission, have got a very good lipid profile. Their lipid levels have gone down, their cholesterol levels have gone down. They're very happy about it. So this is not a single point of, um, it's not only for one, chronic condition. It is for the multiple chronic condition such as overweight, obesity, um, liver fat, any high cholesterol, hyperlipidemia, high cholesterolemia and also diabetes and also for the general general healthy um, lifestyle, healthy energetic lifestyle. So it is evidence based, it's sustainable, high adherence, sustainable in the sense we don't need to buy any specific products, whatever you're cooking, you're having in the kitchen, just make sure you're plated in the same way and make sure to add more vegetables and keep some proteins and keep a little amount of carbohydrates and plate it in this way. So it's completely safe and sustainable. Next slide, please. Okay, so what we recommend here in our program. I will sure come to that point, Dr. Bargavi. Yes, we, I'll tell you about the fruits. So the carbohydrates, so this is a calorie restricted diet, of course, because we have to restrict the calories. Without calorie restrictions, weight loss cannot happen. So if I'm going to do give a calorie deficit diet of 500 kilocalories per day, I can expect 0.5 to 1 kg weight loss per week. This is something which I can expect. So our plate normally approximately provides the ballpark figure around 1,500 to 1,600 calories. Out of that, we recommend 40 to 40, 45 percentage of the calories to come from the carbohydrate, which is rated as a medium carbohydrate. Because when I go below 50, it is a very low carbohydrate diet, which is similar to that of a very keto diet. 50 to 130 is the low carb diet, and then 130 to 225, it's a medium carb, and normal carbohydrates will be 225 to 325 grams. That is normal carb, high carb diet. So we are going in for a median carbohydrate. The reason why I chose this model is because in a carb abundant society like India, we cannot expect people to completely cut out carbs. We cannot put them on a very low carb, and it's very difficult. It's not practically possible. So I need to see a way where we can give a practical practical solution to the patient. They know what is diabetes. They know the complication. What patients are struggling is how to achieve that, how to maintain that. So that is where my role comes in. I see as a dietitian, I want to help my patients. So we give that the constitution of the plate is around 40 to 45 percentage of the calories. And then the proteins. Now the proteins are key here. So because we also are, we are also asked, do I have to add proteins in every meal? Won't the protein damage the kidneys? Of course, there are guidelines, but none of the guidelines say that you have to avoid proteins unless and until you have evidence. You are told by the um, doctor. So not 0.8 to 1 kg. Thank you, Dr. Hema. I'll just quickly run over. And so 20 to 30 percentage of the calories comes from proteins. So next slide, please. So this is the criteria. Uh, again, I think Dr. Hema ran through it. We take patients with 70 and exclusion type 1 diabetes. We don't take any advanced systemic illness. And the tools used, we use the CGM in our program and also various other validated questionnaires. And the platform, WhatsApp. And the unique feature is daily monitoring of patients because this is where we establish the continuity of care. This is what the patient requires and this is what we do, bridging the gap, the continuity of care. And we also do the multidisciplinary approach where all the teams speak, uh, all of us come together, speak about, speak the same language regarding a patient, doctors, dietitian, and the uh, physical fitness expert. So this is our program model. And the next step is our dietary, we also establish the technique which we use in our consultation is the behavior change communication technique, which is a strategic way to introduce to introduce the communication, to introduce the rapport with the patients, to encourage them to adapt positive health behaviors. This is not new. We have already used in the Family Health International as a health education module in the vaccine programs, in polio vaccine programs. It was already used previously in India. Then it, uh, my, it, it became like information, education, communication, and now it is termed as behavior change communication. And we also have weekly 
it's our program is a stepwise approach it's a gradual approach it's not a drastic approach and what we and also we introduce various thematic group sessions continuous education sessions for the participants and for anybody who wants to talk about diabetes remission um next one so these are the plates this is not nothing new with this plate for example this plate will not cause spikes in the blood sugar this plate will not this plate will not i can for sure this plate will not they all look interesting they never look boring look at the colorful combination and there is no specific product like whey protein powder or nothing so this plate imagine this plate could cause weight loss this plate could cause diabetes remission of course combined with physical activity as well and so, it also causes satiety most yes. patients are full with this plate so this is satiety because they can't even finish this plate i can't. we have tested ourselves and we can't finish the plate you can go and test at home fill up half your plate with veggies one dosa and then one egg you not be able to eat more than one dosa and start on with veggies first next one so the results we have 250 plus happy patients and the proof is in the pudding through that diet intervention we have not used any medications for weight loss there are medications like um zenical allostat which is used widely in the western countries for weight loss but we are not used anything so with this plate model we are able to achieve 8 to 10 kg of weight loss and this includes total participants not just the participants for diabetes remission or optimization it's total and we are able to manage a show around 1.5 hba1c average reduction and 35 percentage achieved no um, they achieved technically remission with zero medication and 95 percentage of the participants were able to amend their medication reduce their medications so next and we are also proud to present the results and talk about the techniques methodology and our overall view of practo transform program and even the diabetes remission program in the international and the national platforms this this is us we are presenting at the diabetes uk and our team presenting at the trendo 2023 in chennai so we are proud of that um so next one so moving on before moving on to uh, give handing over to uh, chaitanya to talk about how you can create a multidisciplinary team how we can do the diabetes remission and how we can do the joint discussion with the team how do you want to partner with practo he will be the best person to answer your queries and any questions i'm happy to take or if we don't have the time we can push the questions to the last i think there is one doctor yeah. dr ashok wants to ask something dr ashok hello yeah hi what is all about that what if, what was that what is the question what is this what is this program what is going on i don't understand so you mean is the program so chaitanya will um, will explain chaitanya this. chaitanya yeah. will explain what exactly the program is because so, so, so far, far we have yeah. spoken yeah we have spoken about the science behind remission and the dietetic aspects so it's an educational seminar but based on all these facts and based on the evidence we have we have designed a program for people with diabetes where we provide that lifestyle care we provide that dietetic support and the fitness support and you provide you as doctors to to help doctors you know achieve this remission um so chaitanya will uh, elaborate on this about the program because um, i as a medic i am not authorized to promote program so i let chaitanya speak about the program but this is a lifestyle aid for all doctors to okay. achieve remission so i'll pass okay. over to anya uh, yeah well lastly there's also a question on this including fruits uh, in the diet and what type of fruits uh, can you address do that we have the time to talk about it kishan or uh, can we do that now or later what yes, would you suggest time. we have time, we have time. Yeah. okay you... regarding the fruits fruits are also carbohydrates they come under the carbohydrate category and uh, they also have fiber but the fiber content in the fruit is less than the vegetable content um so if i say vegetables have less sugar more fiber with the fruits has more sugar and less fiber and fruit because when the plate model says we need a protein to establish protein and fiber there are both the pillars that are holding the carbohydrates so the fruit doesn't have a protein so fruit uh we need to make sure that we take one fruit at a time alongside the protein so that we don't allow the blood sugars to spike it has to be controlled and the other point is consuming a lot of fruit where does that end is it any more good do we have to consume lot of fruits to keep us healthy not at all because there are several studies which are continuously showing that the fructose 
the fruit sugar tries to uh, it converts to cholesterol the bad cholesterol quite quickly rather than the glucose even more so than the glu glucose so if one has to indulge on fruits consuming more of fruits will lead to weight gain directly weight gain indirectly so it's better to keep it two or three fruits a day i would say one or two a day and for those who are aiming to lose weight keep it to definitely two a day no more than two and those who are not worried about the weight if you wanted to have a healthy lifestyle three fruits a day is fine and make sure you're eating one fruit at a time as a snack do not combine it with a meat because meal you're already having a carbohydrate fruit is also a carbohydrate so don't overdo the carbs so try to eat it as a snack and the time gap is three to four hours at least because it directly relates with the gastric transit transit time so the meal has to move out of the tummy before you put in the next snack so make sure the gap between the meal and the snack is at least three to four hours and take your fruit as a whole not as a uh, puree not as a juice because juice is nothing but a sugar water so try to eat it as a whole and eat it along with the protein to avoid sugar spice in case of diabetes yeah there are portions to fruit so we have we have lot of those fruit portions what is the portion what is called one serving your palm whatever fits on your palm any medium fruit one that is the size any small one two keep that as a guidance that is one Dr. Shridhar? Yeah, I would like to know what are the fats uh, which we need to include like uh, saturated and unsaturated. Uh, can okay. you just give some more guidelines regarding that? Yeah, sure. Sure, there are two, four different types of fat. We have monounsaturated, polyunsaturated, saturated and trans fats. Now the monounsaturated, polyunsaturated, the mono ones are the rapeseed, the coconut oil, the sorry, the canola oil, peanut oil, rapeseed oil, oil olives, nuts, they're all monopolysaturated the nuts seeds they're all healthy fats so if you have a lean diabetes who you don't want to lose further weight who you want to maintain the blood sugars at the same time not allowing you know, preventing them to lose further weight the best way to achieve their uh, maintain stabilize the weight or even promote weight gain in those lean diabetes patients is through introducing healthy fats because nuts are high in calories and they are great uh, satiety factor their great filling factor as well and they don't raise spike blood sugars so health avocado olive oils nuts and seeds they're all good fats then going on to the saturated fat ghee butter desi ghee even the homemade ghee i get a lot of questions is a homemade ghee good of course it's not imagine it's a very solid very thick at that state and when we swallow that it's going to create plaques in the sides of the arteries and the blood vessels. So it's not safe. And specifically, it's not safe for the people with diabetes because they have double the risk of cardiovascular disorders. So any homemade ghee, no. It's, um, it's a big no. And also, um, the fat in the milk is also full cream. It's also saturated fat, full creams, paneer, everything. So the guidelines is maintain the portions for milk, milk products, milk 200 ml and the paneer and anything cheese or i mean paneer uh, which is around 50 grams is recommended and cheese is around a small matchbox matchbox size because the fat in it is a saturated fat and butter and desi ghee please don't recommend and the last one is the trans fat where we fry the food and those fried items the fried oil is one thing which is carcinogenic and that is not at all recommended so the good fat to answer your question avocado nuts oil seeds fish fish products um egg and um, portioned dairy products they're all good fat and which is very useful when you have a patient with lean diabetes where you want to control diabetes yet stabilize the weight or promote weight gain okay yeah uh, one question is uh, regarding uh, coconut oil because of late mm -hmm. the coconut oil they have been like promoting is as a very healthy option coconut oil no coconut oil is also not in like any other oil a tablespoon is recommended a tablespoon is 30 mil, uh, two tablespoon is 30 mils, one tablespoon is 15 mils. One tablespoon per person per day is the recommended allowance of oil. Whether it is a coconut oil, olive oil, canola oil, peanut oil, rapeseed oil, sunflower oil, vegetable oil. So okay. we can't say one oil and definitely coconut oil, see anything that is solid at room temperature is bad. But then these ones are the liquid ones. So there is nothing, oil has already has nine calories in it per gram. So any oil, in a limited quantity, we, re we, re we require fat. 
but not in a very high quantity. And there are no specific benefits of coconut oil, which is not evidence based. Dr. Shri, so are you actually okay. specifically asking regarding the keto diets where uh, coconut oil is used in coffee? As a yeah, coffee and coconut coffee. oil is used. And unfortunately, we see people coming out with a high cholesterol level and high lipid levels in keto diet. This is where patients interpret wrongly or misinterpret the diets. So a keto diet doesn't, it suggests healthy fat. But people do take the healthy fat as fat and then they overdo it. When they overdo it, yes, they will they will probably they will correct their diabetes factors but what on the par on in parallel what happens is what they are failing to understand is how it affects their lipid profile so the best if you want to increase the good cholesterol the best way to increase the good cholesterol is through the nuts seeds and olive oil and fish because these are all evidence based whereas not the coconut oil and the evidence is still patchy okay uh, just so just i'll just summarize so in the tea plate model the top portion is the one uh, half is vegetable, one fourth is protein, and one fourth is carbs. Yes. And the fats should be fifteen. Uh, uh, fifteen See, ml. See the fat. Day. The reason, yeah, fifteen ml. Oh, that is one tablespoon. I have not in this. Remember, this tea plate doesn't have a fruit. This tea plate doesn't have a fat because fat. When you introduce lean proteins, fish contains fat. And whenever we are cooking anything, imagine if you are cooking an omelette or dosa, you put oil and cook. It contains fat okay. already. You don't need the added fat. And this will also help to reduce the fatty liver disease. Uh, I mean, correct the fat in the liver uh, fat in the liver one. So if you want any patient to correct the fatty liver, please promote the vegetables are the best way. And the healthy fat, make sure, be careful when you're promoting the fats to patients. Because they sometimes I see them overdoing it. So just to make a comment that for many years, for decades, the marketing industry, the health industry was focusing heavily on low fat diet as a means of making people healthy slowly. And but they never cared about the carbs. So what happened was there was a huge upsurge of carb intake in the so-called healthy low fat carbs. And now we are slowly, slowly moving from low fat, this low fat, that low fat milk, low fat, everything to low carb and low sugar. And I think that is a healthy move. But like Vilasini said, we should not overdo the fat just because we are having low carbs. But remember that for us, especially for Indians, our problem is carbs. I don't think many of our diabetic people, they go out and eat health, uh, fried food every day. Their problem is large amounts of uh, rice and large amounts of carbs. And many of them come and tell me, I don't eat fried food at all. I eat home food. I don't eat oil. I don't eat this. But the bigger elephant in the room is carbs. I it's would a just carbs. Say and, and one more thing also. Uh, when promoting the protein bar, protein shakes, what we fail to see is the sugar content in the protein bars and the protein shakes because the, none of the labels will uh, evidently say it as high sugar and they don't even talk about sugar on the label. So if patients ask you about a specific protein bar or a protein shake, that is not at all required. And if they take, also please check what does the protein bar contains because we always check, we make sure our, our patients, well, I ask them to take a photograph of the protein bars and see the ingredients. So ingredients matter a lot. And the, the tweak is around if they if they have a sweet tooth, then the tweak is around this usage of sweeteners, which is a whole different big topic. So there are multiple sweeteners which we can prescribe so that they can satisfy the sweet tooth. Yes, Dr. Sridhar? Yeah, yeah. I've, I've, I've already talked to you. Already questions. Somebody else okay, has asked. Yes. Anyone else? Yes, uh, Bilasnirat, I think there is multi-specialty clinic. To, yes, yeah. yeah I, I'm Dr. Rajeshree here. I just want to ask one question. This is regarding a breakfast of uh, oats and uh, rolled oats and low-fat milk and uh, one fruit. Uh, is, is that considered a good healthy breakfast option? Oh, okay, so we need to break down what... Uh, now, the details you have given me is rolled oats milk yes. and fruit yes. right now fruit yes. comes in the carbohydrates oats also comes yeah. in the carbohydrates now two it's a two carbohydrate loaded one and with a little milk because here the good point is the milk basically because milk has a protein and a fat which is going to give the satiety factor not the oats and the fruit and also the other thing the question is how many what is the portion of oats because the normal recommended portion of oats is around three to four tablespoon which is around 45 grams let's say 40 to 45 grams so when I have 45 grams of oats, that satisfies one carbohydrate serving per meal. If I'm going to place an extra amount of fruit there, that is an extra serving of carbohydrate, which will spike the blood sugars, which, okay. or, which may cause weight gain. So better to make, make sure if you want to take oats, make sure and 
also measure your cooked or if you have cooked it's better to measure the cooked weight so make sure okay. you have 40 grams 45 grams roughly around three tablespoons of oats Try to add milk. Don't make it very sloppy because our aim is not to make the food run, gush down to the food pipe. Chew and eat. So add milk. But for additional protein, if you want, you can chop some almonds or walnuts. That can give at least five. Never overdo the nuts again because 10 almonds can easily contain 100 calories. So chop some nuts or chop some walnuts. And if you want a sweet taste, sometimes patients do want a, a sweet taste. I will ask them to take one or two berries or a small apple stick and chop a small apple stick rather than taking a whole fruit. That will not um, spike the blood sugars provided. And try to make sure you have your regular 10 minute walk or do some activity after a meal. But this is a good way to take oats. Yes, okay. thank you so okay. much. Thank you, thank you. There is one more question, uh, Vilasti. Is, is it good to suggest good fats in a daily plate? and? Yeah. Good fats, unless and until they ask for it, I would say, see what their lipid profile, if they are overweight, tell them you don't need to, for example, this plate, the vada plate, that is not a very good plate because it has two vadas, but this is a very good patient who has followed religiously to the core. So one allowance is every, fine. Now here, uh, let's say here, this plate, the first plate, they have got a peanut butter spreaded on a toast. Peanut butter is nothing but a fat, one tablespoon of peanut butter, right? And they also got um, dosa, chapati or dosa, which they might have added a little omelet, bit of omelet. omelet. So again, they might, again, omelet. Omelet in the sense, it again has a good fat on its own. So they've already got the fat from the, in that meal. So they don't need to add an extra fat. This is what I would like you to emphasize to your patients. You don't need to specifically emphasize on a fat because all our Indian cooking, we incorporate fat. There's no cooking we do without fat apart from the salad if you're consuming. Unless and until if they ask, then you can promote. For example, lean diabetes, if you're really concerned, they're losing weight rapidly, then make sure, encourage them to have a small and often approach. Eat at every two to three hours, they can have a healthy small portion of nuts or yogurt or curd or sundal or you know seasoned lentils. They're all good snacks, which will not spike the blood sugars, but it will help to stabilize the weight loss and it will promote weight gain. That will be helpful for the lean diabetes patients. Okay. Any questions? Hello. Yeah, just final question. Mm -hmm. Like for healthy people, uh, what do you recommend uh, regarding intermittent fasting? Like, not the diabetics, healthy hmm. people, and what about diabetics? How to incorporate intermittent fasting if it is advised? Because See, a lot of things are going around on intermittent fasting. Yeah, nowadays. yeah. Very good question, Doctor Sridhar. Because I would say there are a lot of intermittent fasting is fine. It is. This intermittent fasting and other low calorie, very low calorie diets are used as a jump start method. If I want to rapidly lose weight, imagine, then if I have something coming up, if I want to, in a pre-operative stage, we recommend intermittent fasting or very low calorie diet. But intermittent fasting, are they doing it properly is one question. And can they follow that lifelong is another question. For I'm not going to promote intermittent fasting for diabetes, but for healthy people. So if I'm going to start and stop on something, my metabolism will slow down automatically. So the body will not know what is my routine. Unless and I'm going to, if I'm going to be on intermittent fasting, if I'm going to be on it for throughout my lifestyle, maybe it will work out beautifully for me. I will lose a lot of weight. But again, my nutritional adequacy will be a question mark. Am I nutritionally adequate? I might become malnourished. I might lose my micro, I might compromise my micronutrient things. So there are several uh, several ways to it. And the other thing is, it is kind of widely in, misinterpreted by the patients. What they do is they fast for 8 to 12 hours. And then they overload at one point. That is also there. Um, so which is which means you are like kind of starving, making the body starve and then overloading it. At this point, what will happen? The brain will think, okay, so this person has starved for a long time and now the food is coming through. It will slow down the metabolism. It will start saving the calories. It will not spend the calories, meaning which they will not have an effective weight loss. They will, in fact, put put on weight. And there are other theories associated, which are all being widely studied. There's a compensatory, compensatory dietary mechanism, where when they think they have starved already, they fasted already, the second part of the day, they'll come and eat, overeat, thinking they have to compensate. The brain needs to compensate for the first half of the day. So they wanted to compensate again overeating. Overeating and 
more having more calories than what the tummy can hold all this will spiral up the metabolic profile and that will disrupt the balance so when the balance is disrupted it is very unlikely that for the patient to achieve anything whatever they wanted to achieve in a healthy lifestyle so this is in a, this is also evidence based and many clinical practice we have seen many people doing the fasting they come and tell me that they are doing lot of fasting but they are not losing weight it doesn't so, work like that yeah, in an answer to your question dr sridhar the data on time restrictive eating it's what it's called tre time rest time restricted eating the data is very new so there is some data from the us uh, about time restricted eating that has shown weight loss and has shown some blood pressure drop but has not consistently shown diabetes remission or diabetes improvement so i think the answer to your question is uh, that what vilasini said is sustainability is if that is a quick question okay that's a big question mark but that we don't have medic, big medical data to prefer that or not to say yes or no on either way so there is no strong data to suggest do it or do not do it not if do it, it works for the patient and they lose weight then i suppose there is no strong reason to say no but vilasini's point is what they put on the plate during those hours and how often they eat may have an impact but long term data is lacking so uh, why can we patients we don't have data it's an evidence we don't have data reason. and if for religious reason if for uh, ramadan during ramadan time if they wanted to i don't control them but i make sure whenever they are restarting their whenever they are breaking their fast they have to be very mindful that is there one thing there is some I data coming very soon last year's ada there was some data on um, time restricted eating but we don't have data for diabetes and for healthy people we don't have but there is some evidence for weight loss and for blood weight pressure weight. reduction Yeah. Okay, uh, ma'am. What I want to know is like uh, many of them they say that like instead of eating two hours, like if we restrict the time, like the regular food, if we take in a particular time, let's say from eight o'clock to six o'clock, like so the fourteen hours, it's the body is in the fast. So that way is better than you know prolonging no the. Data. No data. There is absolutely yeah, no data. We don't data have data. For long periods of fast actually is better than having uh, you know free periods of fast. There is no data. so there is data for very because this has not been studied properly in trials yet so i tell patients there is no evidence for this mm. that this is better than that that having low calories but having uh, throughout the day versus having the same calories in a short period and then fasting for a long period is that better putting your pancreas mm. to rest is that better there is a lot of theory to say putting your pancreas and liver to rest on fasting is helpful but the uh, robust data is not available so as doctors yeah. or in medical healthcare professionals we are not in a position to recommend one way or the other so we don't recommend i don't and i don't recommend it and I, because i don't have data but if the patient insists i'll say go ahead but be mindful of when you are breaking the fast so again the play, rule applies don't overdo on carbs make sure you're starting with the vegetables and please go from there so that Just way because some to the point there are, there have been some there is a very nice paper by roy taylor if you can look at that talks about various dietary approaches in diabetes it talks about mediterranean diet it talks about fasting it talks about uh, low calorie diet it talks about shakes the final conclusion is there is no evidence to choose one diet over the other the yeah, final that, conclusion says that what you do does not matter so much as long as you achieve the outcome of weight loss and then what you choose the method you choose depends on the patient the sustainability the availability the patient's liking etc so far so currently we are in a space where we don't have much evidence choosing one method over the other that's where we are i think in the years to come there will be uh, more evidence on there are some groups in the us that are working on time restricted eating only following maybe the next year ada uh, we will have more data on that but currently as we stand i will post that link on this um, comment box about a very nice editorial by roy taylor about different diets to achieve diabetes remission and the conclusion See, the is no, nothing is better than the other yeah again the point of sustainability will come into picture no matter what so um yeah um that is that is has your question been answered dr shree yeah yes 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 yeah, thank you vilasi i think we'll just take one last question and then we'll uh, move on with uh, chetan yeah talking about the program uh, there's a question on uh, patients with di uh, diabetes and working night shifts especially agents and then how do we manage that and their schedules yeah this is a very good question this is a been a very big problem here as well but again what i would say so if they are sleeping the day time probably the night time they can consider that as a day and consider the three regular if they are starting for example if they are having a dinner at home and they are leaving for the night shift let the dinner be the t shaped model with all the healthy meals with all the composition so that they are satisfied and then they go for the shift after 3 4 hours let them take a small snack and then in the mid shift of their hours they can have a small lunch and then every 
it's again four hours gap again and the last thing will be when they end the shift when they come home let them have a small that will be the dinner for them they can have a small breakfast or whatever small meal and they have to go for a sleep so whatever time of the day consider the shift workers to have the shift the daytime to the night time whatever we are doing in the day time they have to do in the night time and they must have a good sleep in the daytime but unfortunately what happens is the daytime people with the lack of sleep due to various other environmental factors like the light the uh, the other other issues other various issues they are not able to get a proper sleep and when they don't get a proper sleep what they do they try to keep themselves awake the brain keep them try to the brain will help to keep them awake through inducing the cravings and they will keep on munching snacking that is why sleep deprivation has already been established to lead to extra calorie consumption even up to a calories of around uh, 400 500 equivalent to a meal 600 calories so i would suggest keep the night shift and keep your three meals in the night and then do your physical activity have a good sleep in the daytime and the evening time before your shift start try to do a good 30 minutes to one hour physical activity so that you are doing the same normal pattern but just the time of the day is different is that all right yeah yeah, yeah. all right Keshin. i think yeah yeah over to you chaitanya thanks thanks Vilasni. Uh, thank you your, guys thank you for listening on dietetics and uh, dr hema always a pleasure listening to you around the science of remission uh, so folks i i'm chaitanya i take care of partnerships at acto i've uh, uh, previously worked with a lot of doctors in bringing lifestyle modifications and in the uh, given the fact that we are short of time let me keep this short and sweet uh, idea is that we basically bring a lot of partnerships to our partner doctors and we have various forms of collaboration ranging from uh, providing technology people and the infrastructure right like we have created a layer of technology as well as uh, uh, dietitians and fitness experts who are all needed for uh, uh, helping a clinician or a, a doctor to deliver diabetes remission for your patients friends and family so we believe like let's say this can help this partnership can help uh, bring like a very holistic approach and encompass various lifestyle adjustments to your practice and facilitate diabetes remission to your patients. So Practo has a lot of this infrastructure today uh, in the form of technology and people. And should you be interested, uh, 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 someone who's helping with the slides, if you can just put on my number there, we would be happy to uh, uh, partner with you in various levels, be it at the clinic, be it uh, for your friends and family and I have my number here which is there on the slides and I would love to come meet you have a coffee and then figure out what are the synergies <clears throat> that we can uh, work work around with right so uh, any any doctor who is interested in working with Practo we have certain programs and certain ways of working in which we can uh, figure out a partnership we can figure out a collaboration and most importantly the lifestyle modification is what we bring in as a support layer uh, given your time and yeah, uh, the patients need for it. So that's that's largely what uh, we at Tractor do. And uh, my number is there. I can also drop my email ID in the chat. Anyone who's interested would love to work with you and chat with you for further details around this. I think, <clears throat> I think that's largely it. I think we'll skip the programs part given the fact that we are just short of time today and uh, anything else we can cover offline in a one-on-one -on -one conversation sure okay uh, thank you uh, chaitanya just want to check one if anyone has uh, one more quick any questions maybe we can spend a minute on those questions and then we can wrap it up Okay, so I don't think we have any other questions. Uh, Chaitanya has put in, I mean, we have put in uh, Chaitanya's details in the chat box, his number and email ID. So if you have any questions regarding the program, feel free to reach out to Chaitanya. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Hema and Vilasini for sharing such uh, insights and deep diving into it so deeply. Uh, thank you. Have a nice rest of the day. Thank you, Keshul. Thank you, Chaitanya. Thank you, Thank you, all. Thank you. Thank you Chaitanya. Thank you, Keshul. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Hima. Thank you. Bye. Bye.